the most important topics, and the most influential voices. Leaders is a forum where industry experts and innovators share their experiences and perspectives on business-critical issues. This is content that drives decision-making. Join the conversation today at thebondbuyer.com forward slash leaders. Hi, everybody. I'm Northeast Regional Editor Paul Burton, and our guest today is Adam Angievsky, the founder and CEO of transparency organization OpenTheBooks.com, and he is a former Republican candidate for Illinois governor. Our topic today is wasteful government spending. Adam, hi. Great to have you back. Welcome. Great to be on the program, Paul. I think this is our third podcast. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Yes, very much so. Uh, first of all, tell our national audience, especially our first-time listeners, about Open the Books. OpenTheBooks.com, we're unique. Here's our mission, every dime online in real time. We believe that citizens should be able to follow the money locally, across their state, and even their federal government. So, Paul, last year, we filed 40,000 Freedom of Information Act requests on nearly every single substantial public body in this entire country that had never been done before in the history of America. And we successfully captured $6 trillion of federal, state, and local spending. For the first time in history, people can come to our website and see virtually every single public employee's salary and pension record at every level of government across the United States, including in the communities where they live. That's quite an undertaking. How big a staff do you have there? So we've got about 28 full-time equivalents. And most of those, 24 of those, are on the data capture side. So those are the folks that use our proprietary Freedom of Information Act tool to file and follow up with 40,000 requests every single year. Okay, let's uh, get to, first of all, the uh, $2 trillion American Rescue Plan that uh, President Biden signed. And it uh, constantly begs the question, did the right places get the money? We're talking about $350 billion in state and local congressional bailout funding. And uh, you say crazy rich communities got the money. Uh, California got $42, million, $42 billion, rather, and then it disclosed a $75 billion budget surplus. And you also said the top 100 richest places received $100 million and so forth, places like Palm Beach, Beverly Hills, Greenwich, Connecticut, and I lived in Connecticut for a decade. I know where Greenwich is. I also know places up the road called Bridgeport, New Haven that could need the money. Well, and let's talk about the amounts they received. So zip code 90210, that's Beverly Hills, California. They were bailed out by Congress for $6.3 million. Just up the road in Atherton, California, right there in the Silicon Valley. This is the richest place in the entire country, Paul. The average household income is north of $525,000. And Congress bailed out Atherton, California for $1.2 million. You got Greenwich. Everybody in New York City had fled to Greenwich, it seemed like, at one point or another during this last year. Greenwich was bailed out for $21 million, the Hamptons for $8 million. Even down in Florida, like Key West, was bailed out for $10 million. And then you have the county in Silicon Valley. Congress bailed out Santa Clara County for over $400 million. Wow. Yeah, you mentioned the zip code 90210. Maybe we could make a separate so proper show about uh, federal bailouts. Well, I think so. And then, you know, we noticed early on that, you know, even red states obviously got bailed out like Utah. Utah had managed their economy well during the pandemic. They actually ended up with a $1.5 billion budget surplus. And this was known ahead of the passage of the American Rescue Act, Congress bailed out Utah state government for another $1.5 billion. The same thing happened in nearby Colorado. Colorado managed their, their budget well. They ended up with a $3.8 billion year-over-year budget surplus, and Congress bailed them out for an additional $4 million. Now, I was just in Colorado over the weekend. They don't even know how to spend it. The governor is doing a listening tour throughout the entire state. They've got so much money, they don't even know how to spend it. Wow. And speaking of the filthy rich, Ivy League colleges are getting huge COVID bailouts. Tell us about it. Well, I think this drives regular people across the country crazy. Paul, you know, these schools charge 60 to 70 grand a year on student tuition. 
They've got collectively the eight schools of the Ivy League have $140 billion in their endowments. Our auditors forecast that that endowment becomes $1 trillion at the same gift and giving rates over the course of the next 20 years. Yet on the pandemic, Congress bailed out the eight schools of the Ivy League for $100. $68 billion, and that was on top of what they got a year ago in the CARES Act of $63 billion. Now, the Ivy League, they don't need taxpayer help, and they should refuse the money. Okay, we'll take a break, and we'll be right back with Adam and Gievsky. Stay with us. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Paul Burton, and we're talking about government waste with Adam Angievsky, the CEO of OpenTheBooks.com. It operates out of Illinois. Uh, Adam, let's stay with the Ivies for a minute. Uh, you mentioned in one of your blogs or columns a Cornell University grad medical graduate student getting a $1 million federal grant to study, and I'm not making this up because you can't make it up, to study how much it hurt to get stung by honeybees. So who's hurting more, the student or us taxpayers? Well, us taxpayers. Look, you know, the Ivy League doesn't need taxpayer help. We've talked about this $140 billion endowment collectively in the eight schools, yet there's a lot of waste in the federal grant making into the Ivy League. Uh, look, the Ivy League is more federal contractor and grant receiver than they are educator today, Paul. We took a look at a six-year period where the Ivy League collected $25 billion worth of federal contracts and grants versus over the same period, $22 billion of student undergraduate tuition, making them more federal contractor than they are educator. Now, we took a look at those grants in a deep dive, and we uncovered waste. You know, one of the uh, instances of waste was $5.7 million on a grant. That's a subsidy. That's aid. It never has to be paid back. And that created a game using fake voicemails from 50 years in the future from 2065. And you could have done this game if you just used your cell phone on the voice record memo. It took no talent. Here, and then you mentioned the $1 million study where a single researcher stung himself all over the body with honeybees to determine what part of the body hurt the most. And it turns out, Paul, drum roll, it's the nostril. <laughs> uh, Cornell, by the way, when I was college age a couple of thousand years ago, Cornell was heavily subsidized by New York State. A lot of people don't realize that. Well, and Cornell is the only uh, school of the Ivy League that is part private and part public. I believe it's also a land-grant college. Right. Okay, let's go to you, uh, a column you write called Waste of, Waste of the Day, and it appears at the website Real Clear Policy. And one of your uh, talking points was quid pro quomo in reference, obviously, to uh, the governor of New York State. What jumps out at you about the governor? So, you know, long before the four scandals hit, you know, the nine women alleging sexual harassment, the alleged claims that he used state resources, state employees to help write his book, the, uh, you know, infamous uh, senior positive executive order sending the senior positive uh, citizens back to the nursing homes, and then the alleged cook the books cover up. Long before all of that, our team dug into the governor on his numbers, on his, you know, taking a look at the intersection between state contractors and uh, the firms don't and principals donating campaign cash. And this is why we call it quid pro quomo. Now, this is entirely legal in the state of New York at arm's length if it's not a quote unquote quid pro quo, right? So we noticed and did the research. We took the state checkbook, matched it up with the governor's campaign donor disclosures, and we found that 347 state vendors gave. $6.2 million to the governor's campaign fund. Now those state vendors just since 2014 pocketed $7 billion. Wow. Oh, now I wanna go into some, go ahead. Uh, something here go ahead. because this is material to Wall Street. It goes right to the big four accounting firms. The big four accounting firms during that period since 2014 through 2019 gave the governor collectively $360,000. Now, Paul, that's a big sum of money, but here's the interesting thing. We found that the same amounts of donation went to the governor on the same days in the same years from the same firms, these big four accounting firms, to the penny. 
One of the donations even had 33 cents attached to it and three out of the four firms gave the same amount on the same day to the governor's campaign fund. Look, this looks like coordination of campaign cash. And I called all the regulators at the state, federal, local level, and no one will touch it. They're, they're supposed to be independent auditors of, uh, of New York government entities. And all of them audit New York government entities at every level, including the state level. And they're coordinating their campaign cash. I think that's a big find. Okay, we saw a piece in Forbes magazine a while ago that said the headline, uh, did Donald, uh, Donald Trump probably donated his entire salary back to the U.S. government? Did he really donate it back? Uh, why don't you cover all the bases on that for us, Adam? So we pulled together all the research in all the news and, and aggregated it into one single repository in my column at Forbes, where I'm a senior contributor. And so we use the word probably. He donated over the course of four years his $400,000 salary, that's 1.6 million. We were not able to tie out the third and fourth quarter of 2020. You know, the president was busy, he was running for reelection and then they had the, the count the votes um, after the election. So there was, you know, he was busy uh, and they did not respond for comment in the first quarter of 2021. But here's why it probably doesn't matter because the president in 13 out of the 14 quarters that we verified, donated the full $100,000. So he was donating the gross amount of his paycheck, not the net amount of his paycheck. So when you add it all up, he gave more than the net amount of his paycheck for his four years in office. Okay, let's talk about something a little more local, but still compelling to all of us. Uh, you said that Los Angeles County lifeguards earned up to 630000 in overtime alone during the last five years. Uh, did they use the cast of Baywatch? <laughs> I don't think they need to use the cast of Baywatch. They've got, you know, the top paid lifeguards in LA are you know, life is a beach for these folks. So we, Paul, we found 81 LA lifeguards made over $200,000 a year. Seven of them made over $300,000 a year. The top paid lifeguard in the latest year available, which is 2019, ahead of the pandemic, made 392,000. And then you correctly mentioned that a single lifeguard over a five-year period, our auditors found he collected 630,000 in overtime alone. And we broke these findings in my column at Forbes and on the editorial page of the Wall Street Journal. Okay, what do we do about it? Well, I think local uh, citizens in LA County, they need to raise their voice. I mean, these are the LA County commissioners and we reached out to them for comment. None of them will go on the record. But Paul, I'm, I'm here to tell you, it gets a little bit worse. It's not only about the inflated salaries, and perquisites, it's also about their lifetime pension. Yes, they have a 30 years and out, as early as age 55. And if you have 30 years in, by age 55, you get roughly 80% of your cash compensation with cost of living adjustments for the rest of your life. <laughs> Okay, finally, Adam, earmarks are back. Uh, you folks mapped uh, more than 3,300 earmarks costing about $10 billion. And by the way, the Republicans lead the Democrats. Uh, share with us some crazy examples, if you will. So this was the first snapshot. So we took a snapshot as soon as the first earmarks were up on the website and, and, and when Nancy Pelosi said they were live. And so today we know that Republicans and Democrats have proposed $21 billion worth of earmarks just two days ago in the, in the, the first version of the House infrastructure bill. They actually had 130 pages, 1,473 individual earmarks in that bill. And Democrats have roughly uh, two thirds of the earmarks and Republicans have a third of the earmarks. Of course, this is the, this is, uh, legalized bribery. Nancy Pelosi wanted to bring back earmarks to get Republican votes on Joe Biden's $6 trillion spending agenda. They want to make it bipartisan and they plan to do it by giving member pet projects, you know, in a member of Congress's district in exchange for the votes on this big spending agenda. Okay, we've covered a lot of ground, uh, Adam. Uh, why don't you share with us some last thoughts? 
Well, uh, last thoughts. I think, you know, Republicans on earmarks, they have forgotten the lessons of the early 2000s. And our honorary chairman, former U.S. Senator Dr. Coburn, was instrumental in putting a ban on earmarks. Now it's up to Mitch McConnell in the Senate. If he keeps Republicans in the Senate off of earmarks, he'll stop everything in the House. We only need McConnell to be strong on this issue. Adam Andrzejewski, thanks much for joining us today. Thank you, Paul. And thank you for listening to this Bond Buyer podcast. I produced this episode with audio production by Justin Rodriguez. Special thanks this week to our guest, Adam Angievsky of OpenTheBooks.com. Rate us, review us, and subscribe to our content at www.thebondbuyer.com slash subscribe. From The Bond Buyer, I'm Paul Burton. Have a great day, everybody. Mm-hmm.